Hello and welcome to uh, Chapter 23, The Western Crisis 1914 to 1937. As you can see, this is the first of three chapters in this uh, in this part that looks at uh, the crises of the 20th century uh, from 1914, so from the, fourth, the outbreak of World War One to 1989 and the end of the Cold War. All right, so let's have a quick think about our sources, uh, primary sources for this chapter, and uh, we begin with two con contrasting narratives of. Uh, what it was like in World War One, um, both from German soldiers. The first uh, is uh, from uh, Ernst Junger in 1920, and it's called the Storm of Steel. And and Junger was uh, quite typical for many people of his time in that he was fully imbued with ideas of um, um, nationalism and militarism, and he glorified in war. He thought that you know war was uh, the answer to everything. Um, his views were very right-wing as well as being uh, anti-Semitic. Um, but as an older man, he did uh, modify his views. And in some ways, this is typical of what happened in Europe and in the world as, an, as a whole, that he started to see that his uh, former views were, um, were, were, were wrong. And at, um, uh, in 1984, uh, at the... Um, uh, 70th uh, memorial of um, one of the particularly brutal battles of World War One, the Battle of Verdun. Um, he um, showed up for that to, uh, and was in commemoration of both uh, French and German troops. And um, he declared the German ideology of war a calamitous mistake. Our second reading is by Eric um, uh, Maria Remarque, uh, All Quiet on the Western Front from 1929. And uh, Remarque's work is, uh, stands in quite a contrast to um, uh, Junger's work and that he's uh, very anti-war and uh, he um, shows some of the brutal uh, realities of what war on the Western uh, Front in the trenches uh, was like and how people started to question um, you know what the what were they doing in in the war? Uh, what, were their leaders any good? Uh, what was the purpose of the war? Who were their enemies, and, and why were they fighting them? And so, all quite on the Western Front. I highly recommend if you've never uh, read it. Um, so you can see these, these two different um, um, sort of stances, and when um, you can see them in the Nazi Party invited Younger to join, he declined. Um, um, but on the other hand, they burnt copies of, of Remarque's book. Our, th our third reading is uh, Mariana Azuela's 1915, The Underdogs. And um, Azuela is a, was a doctor of uh, Pancho Villa in the Mexican Revolution. And um, he fled to the U.S. after the uh, um, after the Mexican Revolution, um, but his um, selection here shows how um, the Mexican Revolution. This is sort of in common with the Chinese Revolution and the Russian Revolution as well. Is that the pe the people that joined as as revolutionists often had very different um, ideological points of view, and this sometimes made the course of revolution very difficult and didn't lead to true social change. And our final reading uh, for uh, chapter 23 is Adolf Hitler's uh, Mein Kampf, or a small section of it. Uh, Hitler, you know who Hitler is, uh, Austrian-born, failed painter, uh, leader of the National so Socialist German Workers' Party, or the Nazi Party. Uh, the Nazi Party has very little to do with socialism, nothing at all to do with modern socialism, such as the Labour Party in, in Britain. Um, but his views that you'll see here are racist and anti-Semitist uh, and anti-communist. He also, uh, you know, um, did not want within his German Reich homosexuals or gypsies or Jehovah's Witnesses or trade unionists or Slavs, um, communists, the disabled. These were all uh, people that he targeted for elimination. And um, when his, you know, kind of horrific views became genocidal reality. Um, so Mein Kampf means my struggle. And so in his mind, this was a struggle to make a racially pure Germany, which would then succeed. 
so those are our readings for today. And I want you to think about Mein Kampf, both in, in, in terms of um, evidence of um, some of the feelings that were around in Germany after uh, World War uh, I as well. Um, okay, so looking at the map here, you can see uh, in green here uh, what we call the central powers, uh, Germany, Austria, Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, and in blue um, the Entente powers, Great Britain, Germany and um, Great Britain, France and Italy. That would make no sense with it. So the Entente powers, Great Britain, France and Italy. Um, Russia had been part of uh, the Entente as well, but had its own revolution in the course of uh, World War I and becomes a communist country and withdraws from uh, the imperialist war of uh, World War I. Um, okay, so in terms of framing the argument, we have three points. Uh, the first is the growing impact of industrialized uh, technologically advanced ways of waging war and the impact of these on uh, networks, hierarchies and cultures. Um, the second point is the causes, events and consequences of what Murillo calls the stupidest war in history. And uh, lastly, uh, how the ideological and political upheavals that both came before and came after the war um, gave rise to revolutions, but also these um, these uh, um, ideologies like communism and fascism. And our patterns and principles points. Um, this one's, what, you know, both are worth repeating. Uh, structures don't make decisions, people make decisions. So uh, if you say, you know, Nazi Germany killed six million people, that's giving Nazi Germany agency that she doesn't have because it's a structure. Uh, so pat structures and patterns are the accumulation of individual actions. So you need to sort of understand why individuals act in that way. And so they can be accumulated into these patterns. And um, finally, when thinking about World War One, we're still looking at some of the same kind of things that we've been looking at uh, in uh, in the past. Um, so this intersection between networks and hierarchies, um, as we've seen, as these um, um, uh, due to industrialization, the shape of the hierarchy changed uh, tremendously uh, with the um, bodies of state and the corporate sphere breaking off from, from the uh, original hierarchy. Um, so in some ways, World War I is an extension of this in, in that it's this uh, tenseness, this merchant di dilemma. How do you resolve all this? Well, one of the ways that was seen to resolve it from the uh, elite point of view was to really emphasize hierarchy even more, even though it wasn't really there anymore, and create this national identity and nationalism, which would goad people along to stay in their place and not have a, some sort of social revolution. So in some ways, we're still talking with uh, about merchant dilemma and in some ways a failed way of dealing with this. Okay. So in thinking about um, industrialization, as I've probably said several times before, um, we really need to stop thinking about human history as a history of progress and, and World War One is really uh, a, a time when people stopped uh, thinking about progress. The 20th century in terms of deaths from weapons of war was the deadliest you know, period ever. Um, and it's the first time that deaths uh, of, of both uh, civilians and soldiers for actually from weapons, it's the first time that they outnumber deaths from uh, disease and famine, which usually accompany war. And we're also talking about massive technological train changes. Um, industrialization brings about um, changes in two uh, arenas. Um, and we kind of see them both here encapsulated in this picture of a German U boat, both in mobility and firepower. Uh, in terms of mobility, um, we have steamships and the railroads, and then followed by um, combustion engine and air transport. Um, but for World War One, in terms of tactical mobility, we're still talking about boots on the ground and marching soldiers on foot and hot with the, accompanied by horse drawn carts. And this sometimes, this is largely true in, in many arenas in World War II as well. Um, but over the course of World War I and beyond, we obviously get tanks and trucks and submarines and zeppelins and planes and aircraft carriers and missiles and satellites as well as radios and telegraphs. Um, 
So you're looking here at uh, uh, planes, so submarines and planes and zeppelins uh, and some early but not very good tanks were all used in, in World War I, uh, but at the same time people are still, uh, you know, have cavalry horses and think that that can be part of this war too. And uh, submarines, um, although they do have uh, firepower, um, they have this, um, you know, extended range and uh, which destroyed merchant shipping. So they threatened this network connections that the modern industrial economy relies upon, um, so both by directly attacking merchant shipping or by the threat of attacking merchant shipping will stop merchant, uh, merchant marine getting goods through. And we're looking here at a map of the uh, European Rail Network in 1913, which you can see is extremely extensive. Okay, so we also have new, um, um, so this photograph is always <laughs> cracks me up. So this is a, a Lancer, okay. So he's a, a traditional horseback troop uh, with his huge lance and he's, this is for a cavalry charge. So you charge and throw your spear and jab people with your lance. And as you can see, the Lancer has his gas mask on just in case he has to charge into a gas, mask, a gas attack. But, you know, what, what does he think is going to happen to the horse or what does the people that have equipped him, because we assume that this soldier's not making his own decision here, uh, think about that. Um, but at the same time, you'll see at the bottom side of this, the um, preparing for the gas attacks with machine guns. So, okay, so both cavalry lance weapons and machine guns in the same war it, it's it's this really shows the extent of the increase in uh, um, firepower um so in terms of uh, he has a rifle over his shoulder and machine guns uh, cannons and artillery different types of munitions um and it's uh, the munitions that were responsible for the majority of world war one casualties and we have, uh, you know, planes and missile-borne explosives, chemical, biological warfare, uh, and the range and the accuracy and the destructive power of the weapons just goes up and up and up and up from here and eventually evolving at the end of uh, World War II into uh, nuclear weapons too. So we're thinking about the scale of uh, the war and the central effect of industrialization, as we've uh, talked about before, is uh, mass, uh, mass uh, demographic growth, mass production, mass consumption, mass politics, mass culture and mass armies. And uh, so even uh, to the extent of um, drawing on the colonies to um, uh, pad out, to increase the, the armies. And so these are the famous uh, Gurkhas uh, fighting on the British side. Um, and literally millions were mobilized um, during um, the World War I. Uh, and uh, World War II. And if we try to think of this in terms of uh, relative comparisons, in World War II, 20 million Russians died, and that's more than the total numbers of troops that fought in the Napoleonic War. Um, so not, not the ones that died, but the ones that fought on both sides, and in World War II, just one side is losing that same amount of, uh, of troops. Um, there was a big mistake made, and that's everybody thought because of their new weaponry and their new mass armies, uh, war would be quite short, uh, but it ended up not being that way. It didn't make for an easy victory on any side. Um, war was um, really a matter of attrition. Uh, who ran out of stuff first would lose. Um, and uh, it was also a horribly impersonal uh, and depersonalized uh, experience. There's no real heroism about sitting in a stinking corpse infested trench waiting to be hit by a shell. There's no face to face encounters anymore. There's no real sort of opportunity uh, to um, show bravery in that extent. And if you think about the natural extension of that into the modern period, we now have drones and computer aided targeting systems. Um, 
on, on one end, but on the <laughs> at the other end, the result for the people at the res uh, at the ends of these missiles is still the same. They die pretty horribly. Um, so the widening effects of the war, because we've talked about uh, blockades, um, stifling. Um, uh, economies stifling network connections and we see this still today with the uh, preliminaries toward uh, trade embargoes no fly zones um, but we also have seen um, the different results as well and then the, I'm going to get to Dwight Eisenhower <laughs> eventually here uh, but industrial war meant um, that uh, the vast international arms trades began working actively to keep uh, global politics unstable. And this is what uh, Dwight Eisenhower was um, warning against uh, about the dangers of the military industrial complex in 1961, um, that these mass arm companies had got so influential that they were starting to tinker with politics. Another effect of industrial war was it was far more common for civilian populations to come under fire. Um, that in terms of vast mobilizing, uh, total war was um, is, is a word that was used. Um, and that's everything within the hierarchy is used to feed the war machine. But in the wake of this, you get a lot of social change. There's a lot of stuff that's break, broken down as you continually feed the war machine. And um, this is uh, this leads to an increased uh, movement uh, for women and discriminated minorities into industrial jobs to replace uh, workers uh, that are now soldiers. Uh, we also get increased state power at this time. Uh, the state grants itself and justifies new interventions in economic affairs, new laws, new regulations, new taxations. Uh, to protect key industries, to limit consumption through rationing, etc. Okay. So just to sort of uh, reiterate again what's going on in the war, and I'd like you to spend a little more time uh, thinking about this and, and looking about it you, as you're going to read the progress of the war on, on your own. Uh, it's way too complicated for me to uh, try to explain it in a 20-minute lecture. Uh, so we're looking here, these um, Germany and Austria eventually joined by uh, the Ottoman Empire. Those are the central powers. Uh, these are the Axis powers, uh, United Kingdom, and France and uh, Russia. Sorry, what's going on? And um, <clears throat> so what is really happening here and what we really need to concentrate on is, is, is what's going on with culture in some ways. We've got this toxic mix of nationalism and militarism in the 20th century. Um, and nationalism promotes war and war reinforces nationalism. So it kind of just, it's just snowballing. Um, and in, in some ways, it seems that this screen image, there's no end to it. But it, it is just a cultural construct, this idea that nationalism and militarism are a good thing. And uh, it can be challenged, therefore, by other screen images, um, like the peace movement of the 1960s. And to the extent that, uh, you know, Junger changes his mind and calls, you know, German militarism a disaster. Um, so things can change um, in, in this front, too. Um, okay, so when we think about the causes of war, um, it's essentially a European civil war uh, and a network of global connections uh, shaped by industrialized imperialism. And it's caused this combination of deep uh, structural conditions that make war uh, possible, even likely, but not inevitable. Remember what we said in Patterns and Principles, uh, structures don't make choices, people do. Uh, but we have some pretty strong structural causes, and then we'll get to the people choices and, and why I have a picture of Kaiser Bill up here. Um, so 
We're looking at a radically transformed world of rapid industrialization, and that's caused traditional elites like Kaiserville uh, to feel challenged and feel uh, less in, um, in control of what's going on. And, and so the conservative monarchies of Germany, Austria, Hungary, Russia, and the Ottomans, the elites feel very buffeted by industrialization and uh, increased network connections. And so this leads them to down the road of militarism and nationalism to sort of protect the country from these changes while at the same time being part of these changes. And so this leads to large cons conscript um, armies, um, industrialized uh, weapons stockpiling. Um, and these large conscript armies are, you know, these are breeding ground for uh, inculcating nationalist ideas in the masses to stop them rebelling, uh, as well as a culture of obedience and um, order taking. Um, so this is all sort of this mix. And then we've talked before about ethnic nationalism, that a lot of these um, countries, uh, uh, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire being the best examples, are huge and they have many ethnicities within them. So if you start to think about uh, why they're promoting this one nationalism, that's like trying to bring them all together, all these different ethnic groups together and really think about themselves as being Ottomans or Aust Austro-Hungarians and support the, the these big empires. Um, the, another thing that happened was these alliances. Um, so um, different countries had made these sort of formal alliances together. And what happens is basically if, if one country went to war with another, it would bring all its mates in and it would be a very big battle. And as we know in World War One, this is exactly what happens when a Serbian ra radical shoots the uh, Archduke uh, Ferdinand um, of Austria-Hungarian Empire, um, the Austria-Hungarians see this as an excuse to go to war with the Serbs. Uh, and because the Germans, and back to Kaiser Bill here, because um, the Germans uh, were in an alliance with the Austrians, they went along and did this. Uh, because the Serbians are Slavs, and the Russians are also Slavs, and they see the Slavic sort of commonality there. The Russians come into the war on the side of the Serbs, and then because France and Russia have a an agreement at this time, France comes into a war on the side of the uh, Russians, and so does Britain eventually, and um, and Italy. Um, the Ottomans eventually join with uh, the central powers. So it all just kind of snowballs. And very, very quickly, war breaks out in a matter of months. It doesn't, there's no sort of big, long build up to it. Uh, and then we talk a, bit, a little bit about individual responsibility. So when I, I used to ask this question on my uh, final is, was World War I uh, inevitable? And people named all those structural consequent causes that I've just talked about. But we also have to think about um, some of the culpability lying on individuals because as I said structures don't go to war, individuals declare war. And um, you know, as we say in the book, and I want you to read this, very, this argument very carefully, how much blame should be uh, uh, placed at the feet of Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. Uh, he seems to have taken some incredibly aggressive policy decisions, and particularly in antagonizing the British at this point in time. And he seems to maybe have had some a, a bit of a personal problem uh, with the British, uh, maybe with his own mother who was British. So he was the grandson of Queen Victoria, and his mother was one of uh, Queen Victoria's daughters. And um, this sort of, sort of led him to have some problems in which he both... Uh, despised and envied uh, Britain. But I'll leave you to to read all about the ins and outs of the war a, a little bit more on your own. Um, thinking about the consequences of the war, um, in the end 17 million people uh, were killed and then if we add to that the 50 to 100 million people who died as a result of the so-called Spanish flu of 1917 to 1920 which was pro you know pretty much spurred on by the, the wartime conditions we're looking at a total death of uh, three to six percent of the world's population um, obviously most of these come from the consuming West 
um, and uh, most of them would have been young men. Um, so this idea of a loss of a generation is quite palpable. And um, the economic costs of the war were also uh, really large. We, we lose this consuming few years, which has a, a massive economic uh, interrupt. We, we lose these consumers. And also the cost of the war wipes out a lot of the uh, gold reserves. Uh, um, many countries are thrown into economic turmoil. The losers are made to pay particularly harsh reparations. And um, the cultural consequences of this are this, it shatters this image of progress. Um, it um, creates in some ways a new culture um, which goes against the adolescent modern, uh, this kind of uh, bragging uh, young man modern, uh, and instead we're looking at a new cynical uh, post-adolescent uh, modern, um, which is a new trend, and this image here uh, reflects some of the deep shock about the ideas of progress and optimism, uh, which have been completely shattered by World War I. The colonized people start to become restless, but not quite at the extent of um, uh, gaining their freedom just yet. The first uh, peoples that do are India in 1947 after World War II. Um, we are also looking at the effects of um, um, subcultural warfare. We've talked about subcultural warfare be as be between demonization of the enemy. Uh, we're looking at um, an American poster here. You can see America and this uh, sort of ape-like brute. You can see this pointed helmet. That means he's a German. Is uh, striding from the ruins of Europe onto uh, American soil, and I think he's probably picking up Lady Liberty on the way, and he's beating them over the head with culture, and um, so enlisting the U.S. Army, and a similar sort of message about strangling uh, the um, the German snake, sorry. Um, and um, in this one, it's the opposite thing. There's the proud German eagle uh, and the uh, voracious British spider. And this one is a, uh, from uh, the time of the Russian Revolution and the civil war in Russia between the white and red armies. Um, Okay, so the, one of the other effects, as I said, is that this breakdown of the old uh, empires. Uh, we talked about Austria, uh, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire being very big, um, uh, multi-ethnic um, em empires. These are broken down, and we're looking here at uh, uh, Ataturk, and, uh, who became the leader of a new uh, secular nationalist state of Turkey in this period. Um, <clears throat> sorry, that was the Mexican Revolution, just going flying by there. Um, I'm going to leave you, leave you to read these things on your own um, because there's, each example has its own particularities. But we see the Mexican Revolution before World War I, um, and we see the Chinese Revolution and the Russian Revolution uh, in, in this period as well, as well as these rise of um, the ideologies of communism and, um, and fascism. Uh, so this is a, a picture of uh, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. And um, I'll let you study this a little bit more on your own in the book, but basically in communism, the uh, party leader and uh, that has this, they have this uh, sort of little hierarchy of their own going on. Um, but there's, there's no corporate um, sphere, as you know, this corporate sphere becomes part of this uh, hierarchy. Um, but the image they're projecting is that there is no state, there is no corporate sphere, and this is a classless egalitarian social sphere. So they see it more like this this sort of uh, squishy, uh, everybody being the same, uh, but it doesn't look like that at all. This is the way it looks like. Uh, and then we're looking here at uh, Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler, who are these uh, the iconic faces of charismatic fascist leadership. 
and uh, so you have this demagogue at the top a one-party state you haven't got rid of the corporate sphere in fascism and it plugs into this constrained social sphere and on the um, screen uh, you see this idealized state this is what they think the state looks like with traditional values and identity and uh, traditional enemies as well okay thank you